Hi, everyone, and welcome to the very first In Conversation with Magellan Partners. And I have to say, I'm absolutely honoured and delighted to be wel welcoming John Neal to the uh, to the discussion, the first discussion we're having of this type. John, as, as, as you all know, is CEO of Lloyd's of London. Uh, he is therefore head of the world's leading insurance and reinsurance marketplace, uh, which is, as, as I'm sure you will appreciate, it is, a, it is a marketplace that transacts, I think last year, and John can maybe talk to this, uh, 36 billion pounds of premium from all over the world, and, and it handles business through actually over 300 broking firms and 80 syndicates and over 50 managing agents. So it's, it's a real ecosystem of the risk and insurance industry, and it is the center of gravity uh, for specialist insurance and, and reinsurance. But uh, uh, John, welcome, and um, you know maybe you just want to give a little bit of perspective on Lloyd's, and then we can go into uh, a, a deeper conversation on some of the very relevant topics that we're facing today. Uh, thanks, Steve, and it's a real pleasure to be with you. The irony's not lost on me that we're normally sat two floors apart in the Lloyd's building, and, and here we are talking to each other study to study uh, uh, um, amazing times really and um, I think as we'll get into fascinating times for us at Lloyd's and certainly really is testing our thesis at the moment of focusing around three strong pillars of performance setting up a, a future the future that's based on a, a different type of technology and a different type of interaction uh, and culture and well-being so all of the topics that we've been talking about for the past um, yeah, twelve months or so really have risen to the fore in the in the past couple of months. But but I mean, firstly, just massive congratulations to you, Steve and, uh, and McGill and Partners, because I think it's a amazing story. I remember talking to you um, when we were both thinking about what we were doing next. Um, but I think you were two years in the making to get to the start point. But I think having accelerated post the discussions with Warburgs and the seed capital that came into your business, I think the last twelve months are. Uh, an amazing story and a tribute to to you and the team that you put together and certainly from a Lloyd's point of view we're super excited about who you are what you're doing what you can represent for the market and, and actually very much part of our community so um, well, well done on the journey so far well thank you and uh, and thank you very much for that John and we're excited about um, what you're doing with um, the Lloyd's blueprint and and the vision for the for the market as we sort of look out to the future um obviously the um the the plans and the blueprint has been um sort of challenged by covid19 and the whole coronavirus situation um and we might talk about that in a in, in a second but it's also amplified the importance that, that you've put on um, trading, you know, electronically in, in the marketplace uh, to complement face-to-face negotiations. And, and certainly it's been, uh, I think, a testing time for brokers and underwriters. But the impression I get, John, is that, um, that the market is, uh, on the whole, is actually doing pretty well in serving clients in this very difficult time. Yeah, I mean, amazingly so. It's hard to put a figure on these things, but I would guess that the market's working at 85 to 90 percent of efficiency, which is truly remarkable. So whilst we would all feel, and I know you would feel, um, that some of the technology that's in place today isn't quite where we want it to be, um, it's been a step in the right direction and it's certainly helped. Um, and then even then, you know, flows into London um, are staggering. They're up by almost 50 percent. So you, you would have thought there might be a slow in churn. But I think, you know, London is nothing if not a surplus market in a positive sense. You know, it adds value to the domestic geographies around the world. So we're seeing huge inflows of not always the easiest to place business at this particular juncture, but but quite a lot of business interest coming into us. So, so the market's functioning um, well, really, and, and certainly better than we could have hoped, I think. It's interesting, John. I was sort of 
looking back not too far in the, in the history books, but it was 10 years ago yesterday that we had the deep water horizon in the Gulf of Mexico that um, yep. ultimately, you know, that explosion um, killed 11 crewmen, but it caused the largest marine oil spill in history and, and an environmental catastrophe of, of real significance. And, and Lloyd's actually was right in the in the middle of that, um, very effectively responding to uh, clients and actually very effectively paying claims. And and I'm sure that, um, you know, as as you're looking at the COVID-19 situation, uh, which is unprecedented in its breadth and scale, uh, you're keen, I know from our conversations from, from last week, you're keen to make sure Lloyd's stays resilient, focused to serve customers, serve brokers around the world yes. and and remain, you know, really at the leading edge of um, of customer service and innovation. I think um, I've had you mention the deep water note horizon loss. I remember the loss well, actually. Um, you, you know, I was working at QB at the time and we were one of the lead insurers on the rig. And um, and from the Lloyd's component of the loss, we settled the loss in full in 72 hours. Um, and I remember a couple of the American insurers wanting to wait until they'd got the proof of loss, the document that said the rig was lost. And, you know, we're watching it on the news thinking it's hit the flipping seabed. I don't think we really need evidence that it's not there anymore. But But I think Lloyd's did its job then and did its job in the way in which we expect it should. But yeah. Sitting on COVID, um, we, we've got a, um, a sort of a quick piece of work in the marketplace at the moment to try and quantify and get our arms around the loss. Um, I, I actually think it's the largest loss in the history of non-life insurance because we're grappling with um, mm. an insurance loss that we would understand. And in our initial claims returns at Lloyd's, we've got 16 different classes of insurance that will respond to the loss in one form or another. And then you've got an asset loss with the challenge that we're all seeing economically, which is which is at least the same size as the insurance loss. So when taken together, um, it really is, without doubt, the most significant loss the industry's ever faced. And um, you'll see us actually later this week sort of try and get on the front foot in the media um, with what we think we can collectively do in representing the marketplace. Where I think, you know, the US I think reacted well. I think we were all impressed by the way in which the auto insurers talked about return of premium payments. The Germans dealt with hospitality BI quite smartly and we've just been a little sluggish in the UK I think to get on the front foot um, and talk about the loss. And I, I think we can, we can talk about you know, the size of a loss. We can talk about the, the, the challenges around business interruption insurance. You know, insurance is about fortuitous loss. No one could possibly contemplate and insure a marketplace and industry insuring everyone in the risk pool for exactly the same loss occurring at exactly the same time. I mean, it's just impossible. And of course, that's where governments step in. Um, but there's, there's a lot we can do. I mean, there'll be, I think, quite a lot of return of premiums going back and we're going to try and put our arms around what I think will be hundreds of millions of pounds of return premiums out of the Lloyd's market as turnovers and wage rolls fall. We can talk about the claims that we're managing. We can talk about the claim itself. And, and maybe we'll talk a little bit in a moment about some of the other things that, that we think we can do to represent Lloyd's and the London market um, in, in a good light or in its best light. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, just back to Deepwater Horizon, um, I was sort of watching that from a, from a distance at, at Aon. It was a great um, advertisement for um, the, the Lloyds and, and London market and how it can respond in a, in a time of crisis in a, in a very, very effective, uh, effective way. Uh, but um, when you look at uh, the, the situation today, and you just referenced, John, the, the size of the... Um, not the loss in terms of the magnitude. You know, you and I have talked uh, last week and the week before. Has, has your view seems to have sort of 
magnified or amplified since since then because you were kind of previously talking to me about it being the size of a sort of medium-sized hurricane if i recall the conversation and it's now gone from that to you know the biggest single loss in non-life insurance um this is obviously a very fast changing situation and uh, could you just give your perspective on that? Is there yeah. new information that's obviously so, changed the view? So I think two things really. So we 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 collected our first um, major claims return um, really at the beginning of April. In fact, our second returns in the marketplace now. Um, and we asked our market to say, look, if you were reserving the loss today, what reserve would you hold? And assuming that this pattern of activity continues for 90 days, what do you think the loss would be then? And roughly speaking, the former, the loss today is sort of the Japanese typhoons in 20, uh, a lot of last year, and the latter would be Harvey, Harvey Irma Maria in 2017. So that's the Lloyd's loss. The Lloyd's loss is disproportionately small, I think, for two reasons. Lloyd's is not a big SME insurer. You know, we do what you do for a living, commercial, corporate and specialty insurance and reinsurance. So we're not big in the SME space, number one. And number two, we're not big in the credit space. And I think it's the credit loss that will creep and creep and creep through the latter part of the year. So so I think our second return, my sense is, will ratify that for Lloyd's, it's a Harvey Irma Maria type loss quantum. But I think globally, when you add up all of the various losses domestically, um, you, you know, you could be talking about an insured loss of somewhere between 70 and 100 billion dollars. And I think the asset loss could be bigger. So so I think for the market, it will be the biggest loss the industry's seen. I think ironically, this time around for Lloyd's and London, it'll be disproportionately small, significant, but disproportionately small. So do, do you see that as... Um you know, a opportunity when navigating through this this crisis and coming out the other end, uh, Lloyd's will be better equipped to get on the front foot and win business, um, win more clients and more opportunities. You said earlier the submissions coming in are, uh, are going up. But obviously, if it's a loss of that magnitude and Lloyd's relative market share is is low there's going to be inevitably winners and losers in this situation yeah i think there are steve and and um we're always surprised aren't we whenever you get a um a complex or significant loss um we're always surprised by who the winners and losers are i mean it's just almost impossible to predict isn't it and you know without naming names you can see some who are struggling at the moment who you might not necessarily have expected to be in the struggle bucket so that they'll definitely be winners and losers um to, to your opening remarks um you know you know i passionately believe as you do that our market needs to think customer and by customer it means that the person that you're bringing to the marketplace and really start to think through what we can do short medium and long term to, to help the customers um and you know as i was referencing earlier on i think short term you know as economic activity falls away then i think premiums inevitably reduce so many policies are just in one form or another by basis of utilization turnover wage or pure utilization so i think there's a bit of help there and, and we need to work out either directly or indirectly as collectively as a marketplace what we can do for those gaps in cover you know for some of those particularly difficult to place classes. So, you know, DNO and credit's just got an awful lot harder to deal with than it perhaps was, you know, three, four, five, six weeks ago. So, yeah, I think there's an opportunity for us to step up. Looking out of the underwriting sphere and into the broking sphere, um, do you feel similarly there'll be winners and losers in the in in the broking space? And, and then I'll ask you the, um, you know, the the obvious question around um, coinciding with COVID-19 really getting, um, you know, a much higher profile globally. We had the the announcement of my old firm, Aon, really impressive organization, 
acquiring another really impressive organization in Willis Towers Watson or announcing the planned acquisition, uh, which just um, is the biggest structural change in the history of insurance and reinsurance broking. And, you know, just be interesting to get your your thoughts on the broking side of the uh, of the landscape as opposed to the underwriting side. I must have missed the latter. So you have to remind me what's going on there. Um, now, if I deal with the former, I, I hope that the different flavour, certainly from Lloyd's in, in my tenure, has been to afford the broking community the respect it deserves. And I'm not just saying that because I'm on a call with you and your team. I, I see Lloyd's as a platform and a platform where the intermediary represents the best interests of their client, whether that's a broker or an end customer, and introduces that party to capital. So for that platform to trade successfully, then each constituent, each stakeholder in that is as important as the other. So I felt we'd um, not afforded the broking community the, the time, the license and the courtesy it deserved. So that's a personal thing. And I, I hope that we're on our way to, to correcting that. Um, there, there will be winners and losers. Uh, you know, you and I have talked about your operating model and the way you think. And, and I like it. I like it a lot. Um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, the market's become inefficient and way too expensive, um, you know, and, and we, it's the key thing we need to address, you, you know, total, total acquisition costs, and I mean total acquisition costs, I'm not really, you know, bothered by brokerage costs per se, it's the total cost of doing business at Lloyd's is about 38.5% of premiums, it's 31% elsewhere in the world. Now, 78% of Lloyd's business is wholesale, i.e. involves a second broker, and that's a massive plus because it reflects the quality, the understanding, the relationship, the solutioning, all of the good things um, that you'd expect in the market, and a price should be paid for that. No doubt in my mind whatsoever. But the differential can't be seven points to the rest of the world, and the rest of the world's trying to get its numbers down. So, you know, our drive within the future at Lloyd's is to try and facilitate a more cost-effective market to be able to trade and operate. Your model does that, both in terms of, um, you, you know, the whole co the whole sell concept at the corporate end and the whole sell concept at introducing flow of business. So you've got exactly the type of nuance that I'd want to see, which is, you know, how do we add value? Where do we add value? And 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 what is that worth? So. So I think that's the right way to go. And there will be winners and losers because there are some in the broking fraternity that think their job is to say, we'll take the aggravation of the market away and charge for doing it. So, you know, when I see brokers charging seven, eight, nine and 10 points for processing border row and um, delegated authority business, I'm sorry, I'm going to take that away. And if that puts them out of business, puts them out of business because that's not what we should be paying for. And, um, you know, there are many that are excited by the change. You are, you know, even someone like David Howden, Hyperion X, thinking slightly differently about the way a business um, could be represented, or, you know, Stephen Hearn with, with Ed. There are, there are some of you that are really thinking how the market could be represented differently. There are many who aren't. And I think, frankly, those that aren't just simply, simply won't survive. And um, so be it. Um, the, the second part of the question, oh, goodness me. I mean, when I joined Lloyd's in um, um, October 2018, four brokers you know, made up 50% of the flow and the other brokers made up the balance. And you thought, you know what, that's, that's all right, actually. That's all right. Um, if you'd asked me 18 months later that four would become three and three would become two, I just, I just couldn't have um, envisaged that. Um, and, you know, ca candidly, that's, that's not an ideal situation if you're representing choice um, as a marketplace at face value. Um, you know, four becoming three was okay. And, and actually, ironically, um, for Lloyd's, and I'll be totally selfish for a moment, um, Marsh acquiring JLT was a good thing. You know, Marsh were relatively agnostic about whether business was placed in London or not, and they bought a massive London-centred 
specialty insurance and reinsurance broker, which had to be a good thing for London. Uh, Aon's always been very, very focused on London, really because of your leadership, Steve, and the way in which you wanted London to be well represented in the Aon um, in the Aon family. So Aon and Willis coming together is very, very different, I think, in terms of um, opportunity and challenge. Um, and it's for a great case in the team to evidence to all of the stakeholders why it makes sense, including to London and to Lloyds. And um, I'll let them go away and do that. In reverse, I think it's a huge opportunity um, because, you know, the market and London actually as a financial centre is pretty good at regenerating itself, reimagining what it could be. Um, and yeah, so the blue shop and the red shop are going to be pretty big. Um, but I think there's an awful lot to go around the edges because red and blue will compete with each other. Every client, I think, needs a second broker. I don't think one broker is enough if they've got complex um, solutions to address and a complex insurance register to deal with. So I think that's a huge opportunity for the next generation of corporate and specialty brokers to step into that space. And, um, and I think then the Lloyds market, again, being selfish, comes to the fore. Its value proposition, its ability to um, build the relationship, connect and create a bespoke client solution holds it in good stead. So, so I think it's a sharp intake of breath when you see it. Um, and there's an awful lot for the Aon team to work through over the next, what, nine to 12 months to get that deal over the line. That They'll get it right for the reasons you said, Steve. I mean, it's a smart, smart organisation. So they'll get that right. Um, and I, I hope they get it right for and with us. But I think, yeah, net, net, when we look back on it in two, three years' time, it would have created a lot more opportunity. Big, yeah, I mean, big win for you. I mean, it's like a dream come true, really, isn't it, with <laughs> all of this going on around? Well, it, in the uh, the two years of planning to set up McGillan Partners, you know, we'd, we'd worked on the assumption that there was a really interesting uh, gap in the market for an alternative specialty firm with a differentiated value proposition and and frankly uh in the analysis and all the work uh yes we expected m a to continue in the industry we didn't see uh the fact that marsh would take out jlt and announce that on the 18th of september i think it was 2018 um uh but that just validated the strategy that frankly i was uh working on pursuing and and then of course you know, um, topping that is the the announcement about Aon and Willis, and you know these are these are great firms, but the the comparisons the the, the most natural comparison we have is uh, as I mentioned to, to you before, we kind of looked at an adjacent industry in, t in financial services being investment banking and saw the emergence of really world-class boutiques with a differentiated value proposition where the acquisition strategy was around talent as opposed to companies. And, and that was a very strong thesis around building the, 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 the firm. And so, you know, we've been pursuing what is one of the most aggressive acquisition strategies in the industry, if not the most aggressive, yeah. But it's of, of talent and, and doing it in partnership with an incredible financial sponsor in, in Warburg Pincus. So, you know, the, the thesis around the model was great before these structural changes. It's now been massively reinforced and it's no reflection of the quality of these global firms. But, you know, in the investment banking world, you have the likes of JP Morgan Chase and the likes of Goldman, who were the equivalent of the sort of Aeons and Marshes. And then you had, as you know, the emergence of firms like Evercore uh, that over a period of time have become the fourth largest investment bank in the world, having hardly done an acquisition and recruited talent. And so, you know, from from our standpoint, it's, it's another evolution of the industry that just... Um, uh, 
validates our strategy. Uh, and the only reflection I would I would say is, you know, when I look back um, 30 or 40 years in the industry, clients had a lot more choice because they had, you know, a very broad range of broking firms that they could choose, particularly the sort of larger, more complex clients. Uh, and I do think it's a shame that client choice has narrowed so dramatically uh, as a result of acquisition activity. And I I certainly get that um, concern from, from the clients, even recognizing that we're talking about really world-class organizations in, you know, Aon, Willis, Taz, Watson, and, and Marsha McLennan. Yeah. But just, um, it's an interesting segue, John. The, uh, you know, we've really put our stall out around um, our talent acquisition strategy and, uh, you know, I do regular webinars with our, our colleagues. We now have 175 colleagues in the firm and, and we've got uh, a number of colleagues uh, who are in the garden waiting to join. We'll shortly be up to 220 colleagues and, uh, and I'm very proud in really saying that the, the assets of the firm are the people in it and I'm proud that we're building a, a business uh, with a lot of practitioners, uh, you know, many of whom have got uh, real depth and, uh, and years of experience. But, um, you know, when we look at um, talent and actually in this crisis safeguarding our talent, and you look at Lloyd's just in terms of the corporation, you've got, uh, if, if, if I'm right, about 980 colleagues in the corporation in London and about 300 worldwide. How are you finding, um, uh, building that, continuing to build that sort of inclusiveness, that team spirit, keeping morale up, keeping an eye on the, the, the sort of health of colleagues? Is there any guidance uh, and, and coaching you can, you can provide to us on this? Because it's a it, it's it's a really important one to to get right, and we're passionate about trying to get it right. Yeah, um, well, I can sort of tell you a bit about um, what we're doing, and I totally agree with you, by the way, and in terms of your strategy, you know, um, you, you know, whether it's Lloyd's strategy or your strategy, it, it's based on the same basic pillars, really, and, and that is that you need to have a performance culture, you know, because ultimately everybody's got backers and you've got to make sense of, of the financial outcomes of what you do. You've got to have a very clear executable vision, AKA a strategy, and you've got to, you've got to have a culture that people want to embrace. You've just got to get those three things right. Nor normal businesses um, have um, two problems. One's legacy and the other's tech. And they're often interrelated. And those are the two head scratchers that people really struggle to get their, their heads around. Um, and I guess, you know, that's where leadership comes into it. So in our Lloyd's world, um, you know, certainly when I went in 18 months ago, the first thing we did was we had our own internal program called Setting Ourselves Up for Success. Ended up with the acronym SOOFS, which is horrible, but... Um, but it was setting ourselves up for success, which was a, a classic, you know, people, location, process, technology piece of work. And it, uh, and it did start with people. So, and that the people was getting the right leadership sorted out, um, ensuring that people were equipped and capable of doing the job, um, trying to get the work environment set up for success, particularly in, in terms of encouraging people to have a more flexible uh, and agile um, work environment to, to operate in um, and our own programs particularly around care in that um, I, I felt the two things that were really missing for our own people was a real vision you know a real vision for Lloyd's that they could relate to um, and, and second was care did we actually care about our employees so a bit like you've done um, I just ripped the rule book up and said look you know if it's um, family leave I don't care whether it's a you know um you know mother father same sex parents i don't care you know parental leave is parental leave everyone gets it care leave everyone gets seven days a year D don't have to tell us everyone's got problems in their life 
if you've got a problem, you take time off to do it. Um, and we've also put up our own sort of mental health and mental well-being programs um, and trained counsellors as well within to, to help. So so the outline pillars for me in terms of um, assuming you get the right leadership in place was having a strategy that the, the our own corporation staff could get excited about, which which is the future at Lloyd's. And, and at the other end of the spectrum, really giving them the confidence that, that we care. We, we, we care about them as, um, as individuals. So that's where we've been focused. And, um, you know, some of that's spilled outside when we encountered, you know, our challenges, what, just over a year ago, when uh, Bloomberg published articles on the market that were uh, pretty shocking, really, in terms of behaviour and standards. Um, and, and you recall our reaction to that. My reaction to that was, do, do you know what? I, I think what we're being told is the marketplace we're in. It's utterly unacceptable and we should do something about it. And, and, and what we were doing for ourselves is actually what's spilled outside. So, you know, speaking up and giving people the confidence to have a voice, uh, the well-being programs that we talk about in that, particularly conscious around mental health, um, and, a, and a real sense around getting um, the tone right for, from a leadership perspective. Well, you, like me, have got zero tolerance for um, that sort of thing, which is which is great. Um, how are you finding it in terms of keeping the motivation of your colleagues going in this remote working environment? And, and how are you f thinking about the sort of communication strategies and and trying to actually make sure that even remotely you can support colleagues who need supporting. So um, it's it's um, it's a good question, and it's getting harder, not easier. Would be the honest answer. So I write to all our staff four days out of five, um, give them a note at the end of the day of um, things that, as an executive, we've been discussing. Um, aspects of either market activity or our own activity that I think will be of interest of them. And, and generally trying to finish the week um, with something that's helpful to them, either in terms of looking at the working day or, you know, you know, whether it's the Headspace app that we launched last week, just trying to do different things to help. And, and then we do a host of things that you're doing, actually. So we've got our own. Um, so immediately post you and I talking, I've got our senior leadership team together. Um, obviously, because of the geographies, we do one at the beginning of the day, one at the end, once a fortnight. We've got an all-staff gathering tomorrow. Um, and we're trying to carry on as much as we can with off-sites virtually of connecting people in every way in every way we, we can at the moment. Um, but it's quite interesting, you know, talking to, and I'm being too simplistic, the younger generation, they're getting a lot more frustrated than than um, those sort of um, older ones of us, not not least personified with my sort of somewhat dodgy grey beard. But the you know, under 35s talking to them are, are going stir crazy. You know, mm -hmm. the ability to connect, to network, to learn, to develop, to hear, to experience is just disappearing um, fast. Um, so we're trying to create some informality around that and, and trying to translate that into some ideas you'll see when we come back to work. So, you know, we've been working on um, a virtual room. So I think the reality of the future of Lloyd's will be that, that there'll be a room. I think it has to be different. I think the somewhat sort of, you know, formulaic, you know, slightly Victorian structure of Lloyd's has to change to be a more collaborative, open uh, forum type space. And I think it's a value proposition in that. But, you know, the room's going to be in London. It's going to be in New York. It's going to be in Miami. It's going to be in Singapore. And, you know, if we've learned one thing through this, the technology can allow that to happen. Um, so we've got some quite exciting ideas as to how we can stand up a virtual room at the same time as stand up the real room and reimagine um, what that might look like. And, um, you know, I think in, a, in an odd sort of way, the sort of... The, the world that we're talking about and moving into from a technology point of view, many would embrace, and you're a, you and the Gillen partners are a huge embracer of that, but it's sort of, it's gently putting the lights to one side, you know, um, and um, 
I've been in, I've had a bit more time. So I've been running three workshops a week on data and tech around some of our mm -hmm. future solutions. Um, and you know, I've talked about this. The the master record contract, the slip, the policy at Lloyd's. For God's sake, it's the same damn document I turned up and started using in 1985. I mean, it's ridiculous that we, no one has completely translated that form. Um, it, it did get a tweak actually post R and R in the mid 90s, but largely the same document. And um, even on the data points, we started three weeks ago with 156 core data points that we were told needed to go into a contract. And um, we've actually got that down to 27. Mm. And, and using secondary and tertiary data points, you can drag the access for that data from other locations, particularly when you're talking around tax. So actually this weird downtime we've been in has given us a bit of breathing space to think quite um, liberally about some of the changes we want to make. And I think probably given us um, what you've got, really, that sort of rejuvenated enthusiasm to be brave and say, you know, because we felt brave when we stood up at the end of September and said, here's our vision for the future of Lloyds. We felt brave. And, um, you know, people were saying, don't you think you're being a bit too ambitious? I'm thinking, keep accusing us of that because you can't be too ambitious. Um, and you get a bit dulled by the market, don't you? You can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. And. And um, we probably, over six months of transition, had got a bit dulled, I think. So actually, an ironical plus of this time is is we've got our um, our bravery back. So, yeah. um, you know, we'll come back and push the buttons harder in terms of digital tech data and um, be snappy and try and get some of those changes um, in as we arrive back at work because we'll arrive back differently, won't we? We'll arrive yeah. back differently, and we've got to seize that moment. I, I think the learning from this crisis is huge in multiple different different areas. But but in terms of the way we work when we go back, um, it's 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 going to change in very profound ways. And and certainly, uh, and in in sort of wrapping up now, John, because you've been very gracious with with your time. We're incredibly excited about the um, the Lloyd's agenda for, for change and and we actually want to not only embrace it but amplify it and the reason we want to do that is because it's great for clients it's actually great for retail brokers that are trying to connect and do more business in the London market and, and in Lloyd's uh, and it's, it's it's you know it's ultimately great for the carriers that make up this extraordinary marketplace and, and and i think if we um if we take some of the learnings from uh this particular time that we've been you know out of the um uh the office embrace it i think we're going to be able to um to really accelerate and amplify the innovation agenda and, and be a much more effective marketplace for uh, for our clients all over the world. And that's exciting. I think so. And I think, um, you know, you and the team will see a bit later um, this week, one of the things that we're doing out of Lloyd's Corporation funds, actually, is setting aside some money. And you and I have spoken about you being involved of, of trying to think what the short, medium and long term um, insurance consequences are of COVID-19. And and the reason for putting some money aside is so that we can put some firepower and, and legs and energy behind the solution, whether that's, you know, short term, what we do in the marketplace in 2020, or whether that's our medium term response to, you know, the next wave of the pandemic, or whether that's longer term, not solving yesterday's problem, because, you know, we had 9-11 and we had terrorism and we've had a pandemic. We know we've got a cyber attack coming the magnitude of which we probably can't imagine. And we know we've got a climate crisis um, coming at us fairly firmly. So it would be quite good to actually seize the opportunity with government and say, look, let's really sit down with an industry that can solve for a $200 billion cap. So why can't we solve for an economic and insurance crisis at the same time? So um, and I know you're excited about being involved and... Um, and uh, it's, it's going to be it's going to be good. I think we've got a chance to really showcase what the insurance industry can do, what London can do. And, and I think, you know, as a fresh 
there's a fresh face with Macgillan Partners. You can be front and centre of that, which um, from a timing point of view is just spot on. Yeah, and and we're excited as you're building globally. Um, you know, we're excited about doing the same thing, so that uh, you know we're not just positioned as a London wholesaler, and your global growth can be really amplified by technology. And uh, uh, and I I just think there's a lot of learnings from this whole situation. Uh, uh, there's a lot of challenges to continue to go through, but. Um, but, uh, you know, I've said to our team, when we manage to come out of this, as we will, hopefully in the not too distant future, you know, we want to really be on the on the front foot, driving forward uh, and, and helping serve our clients and, and accelerate change in the marketplace for the good of everyone. Okay, John, I think you've been very gracious with, with your time. So thank you very much for... Uh, uh, for uh, this uh, allowing us to have this conversation. Uh, my last uh, question was, I'd lost track of how your team in the Premier League were doing, the, the great Crystal Palace. Were they, <laughs> were they heading in the right direction or were they... Well, well on, the, on the basis that um, the season might not finish and, it's, uh, and, and therefore the league table is presented in alphabetical order, it could be our highest finish ever. But uh, <laughs> up, up, and, up until the point it was interrupted, we were respectable mid-table, which for us is, ah. uh, is good news. So yeah. uh, not quite your lofty ambitions, but, but we're all right. We're all right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Steve. It's been really, really good to talk to you. And um, again... Um, congratulations on where you've come in a short space of time and uh, we're watching uh, McGill and Partners with um, real excitement so best right. of luck thanks a lot take care Thank and you. stay safe indeed you too <laughs>